Good afternoon and welcome to the finale and awards ceremony of the 2021 American Pianists Awards produced by the American Pianists Association. I'm Sylvia McNair. And I'm Terrence McKnight. And Sylvia and I are here at the Indiana Landmark Center in Indianapolis, serving as the webcast co-hosts, as well as for the live in-person concert here in the hall. Now, we've been doing this all weekend. We have. <laughs> First on Friday night for the chamber music concert with the finalists and the Dover Quartet. Last night with the finalists in concerto movements with the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra and maestro Gerard Schwartz. And now, this afternoon, for short solo programs by each of the five finalists. So, Sylvia, it's been <laughs> just loads of fun. How much fun are you having? I am having so <laughs> much fun. But I'm also being inspired by everything I'm hearing. It would be thrilling no matter what, but coming after 15 or so months of no live performances, well, it's just marvelous, and it hasn't come a day too soon. Due to the pandemic, the normal process of APA's awards has been greatly reduced. The celebration weekend we are hosting would normally have taken an entire week and been preceded by a season-long series of concerts featuring each of the pianists. That said, the revision still maintains the real artistic core of the awards with solo, chamber music, and concerto performances. And to top it all off, each finalist is receiving a cash award of $50,000, an amount usually only awarded to the winner. As the APA Artistic Director Joel Harrison has said many times, none of this revision is ideal, but it does hold true to the APA mission of advancing and supporting brilliant young American pianists and bringing them to the attention of the world. And, there is nothing revised about the finalists themselves, for they are all major talents deserving of our attention. Agreed. And I think we are about ready to begin this program. Our first pianist today is Mackenzie Melamed. Mackenzie is from Massachusetts. He's got degrees from Juilliard. He's a prize winner in several major international competitions. And he'll be living in Helsinki, Finland this coming year. He's 26 years old. And he'll begin his program today with Funeral Ceremony by Franz Liszt. And he'll conclude with Etude Number 4, marked Vivo by Stravinsky. Let's welcome him to the stage, APA finalist Mackenzie Melamed.
Another great performance from Mackenzie Melamed. That was Funeral Ceremony by Franz Liszt, and he concluded with Etude Number no. 4, marked Vivo by Igor Stravinsky. And I recall that last night he played the first movement of the Beethoven Piano Concerto Number no. 3, and on Friday evening, a couple of movements from a quintet by Zarebsky. Thank you, Mackenzie. Our next performer is Sam Hong. Sam grew up in Fort Worth, Texas and graduated from Texas Christian University at age 16. From there, he went to Peabody for graduate study. He now lives in Boston, is a prize winner of several international competitions. He's 26 years old. His program this afternoon begins with a movement from Schumann's fantasy pieces 
and is followed by Scherzo No. 2 by Chopin. Welcome, Sam Hong.
Thank you, Sam Hong, playing Chopin's Scherzo number two, and music from the fantasy pieces by Robert Schumann. Beautiful playing of beautiful works. Oh, my, yes. Next is APA finalist Michael Davidman. Michael is a native of New York City. He's from a musical family and is currently a graduate student at Juilliard, having previously studied at Curtis. He's a big fan of opera and has been known to improvise encores based on operatic arias. Not sure he'll be doing that today, but his program <laughs> does include <laughs> El Albaisen by, from Iberia, that's by Ibanez, and Rachmaninoff's work Lilacs from Opus 21. He'll conclude with Etude in the Form of a Waltz by Camille Saint-Saëns. Please welcome Michael, Michael Davidman. <laughs>
music by Albeniz, Rachmaninoff, and Saint-Saëns. Beautiful music. Thank you, Michael Davidman. I think it is time for our intermission. Terence, we've reached the midpoint of this recital, and I believe we're ready to take a short break, 15 minutes, before returning to hear two more of these remarkable pianists. Stay right where you are. We've got more great music and pianists coming up. We'll see you in 15.
Yeah, I can see how the... Welcome back to the finale and awards ceremony of the American Pianists Awards. I'm Sylvia McNair. And I'm Terrence McKnight. We're live at the Indiana Landmark Center in Indianapolis, Indiana. We want to thank Steinway & Sons as the presenting sponsor of this program. I'm pleased that the CEO of Steinway, Ron Losby, and his colleague Vivian Chu are both in the audience. Hello, Ron and Vivian. And many thanks for this partnership with APA. The winner of the awards will record on the Steinway & Sons record label. And you know we have a couple other sponsors. Guess what, Sylvia? You were sponsored by Mickey and Janie Maurer. My friends, Mickey and Janie Maurer. Thank you, Mickey and Janie. And you, Terrence, are sponsored by Christian Wolf and Elaine Holden Wolf. Well, thank you, Christian and Elaine. And actually, And thank you again to all the sponsors of the awards. APA is certainly a great organization doing great work, but it could not be done without the kind of community support I'm seeing this weekend. Very impressive. And speaking of impressive, we have yet <laughs> another finalist, Dominic Cayley. Dominic is originally from St. Louis. He studied at Yale and the Colburn School. He lives in Los Angeles, and this was a happy birthday weekend for him. He turned 28 years old. That was Friday, playing concerto. So tonight he's gonna to play Rhapsody in E flat from the Opus 119 by Brahms, followed by the Scriabin Fantasy in B minor. So please welcome finalist, Dominic Cayley.
a great birthday present from you to us. So thank you, Dominic Cayley. Music by Brahms and Scriabin. Terence, I know you're a pianist and deeply connected in the music world. Do you play any of these works that we're hearing this Oh, sure, weekend? I could just go down there and play all of them. Well, right. off just, you go. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think Dominic Cayley just made uh, Scriabin more of a household name. <laughs> um, some of the music that we've, we've heard this weekend, Sylvia, has been some of the most profound, enduring, magical music written for that instrument. And it's just such a delight to hear it all over the course of three days. And these, these pianos have worked so hard for so long oh, to bring us this music. And, you know, I think, you know, that music brings us together, but it also allows us to, to, to look at our lives and see the complexities and challenges of life and maybe perhaps music can make that just a little more understandable, a little more relatable, a little more, you know, just easy to get through some of those challenges by hearing pieces like that. And so I'm just honored to be here uh, with you all and to listen to this great music. So, so thanks for having me here. So am I. And you know what I keep thinking? We've just been through a pandemic for nearly a year and a half, and yet these pianists have stayed safe and healthy, and I am so grateful for that. I'm grateful they kept practicing, despite the fact that all their concerts were canceled, yeah. because we need these wonderfully talented people to to continue to do what they do so well and give us an opportunity to be lifted up yeah. out of the ordinary. I yeah. think that's what I feel happening in, in my heart and soul this yeah. weekend. <laughs> okay, now it's time to hear our final pianist of the afternoon. Kenny Broberg. Kenny is originally from Minneapolis, studied at the University of Houston, now at Park University near Kansas City, a prize winner in major international competitions. He also has an interest in and plays hockey and baseball. Take care of your hands, dear. <laughs> He's 26 years old. Today he will play one work the Dante Sonata of Franz Liszt. Please welcome Kenny Broberg.
Dante Sonata by Franz Liszt, played by Kenny Broberg. <laughs> all right. We've now heard from all finalists, all five of our finalists. So now it's that time for our jury to retire to the conference room for deliberations. I'm so glad it's their job and not ours tonight. Mm -hmm. Shortly we'll, we'll know who the 2021 winner of the American Pianist Awards is. They will receive the Crystal DeHaan Fellowship and become the artist in residence at the University of Indianapolis. While the jury is in deliberations, we've got a short retrospective that we want to share, a video bringing back some of the fond memories of the various parts of the awards process over the last year, despite the pandemic. And it'll give us more of a glimpse into the personalities of these artists. So thanks to the APA staff member, Daniel McCullough, for putting this together. But when we return, we'll have with us the 2017 awards winner, Drew Peterson. He's gonna chat with us about his career and all that has happened since winning four years ago. So don't go far away, we will return. Hi, I'm Joel Harrison, the CEO and Artistic Director of the American Pianists Association. Thank you so much for joining us for this weekend celebration of the 2021 American Pianist Awards. You know, I've said it before, I'm sure I'll say it many more times before this whole thing is over, but this has certainly been a competition year like no other. Despite the rather reduced format of our awards, the high artistic standards and the world-class talent of our pianist is undiminished. I hope you will enjoy this brief retrospective of the 2021 American Pianist Awards, and I know you will be as inspired by our pianists as I have been. Thank you so much. Kenzie Melamed, Sam Hong, Dominic Cayley, Michael Davidman, Kenny Broberg. My grandmother, who passed away just, just very soon after I was born, she was the one who had the kind of musical background. She was an amateur violinist, but she actually, uh, her orchestra was chosen to do a rehearsal or, or something with, uh, with Leonard Bernstein in Tanglewood because I'm from Massachusetts. So uh, she was chosen, I guess, from this amateur orchestra group to go there and, and, and have a maybe a master class or something with him. So that was kind of her rise to fame. And we still have her very old, you know, violin uh, at our home. And uh, I think that the talent came from her as the rest of my family is totally unmusical in every way. <laughs> How are you doing in this crazy, crazy time that we're in? <clears throat> It's, it's really wonderful to be part of the APA family. I've been uh, looking forward to ever since actually my very good friend, uh, Drew Peterson, who I'd been studying with in the, under the same studio at Juilliard. And ever since he won the prize, it's been my goal to get recommended for it and submit um, to have a chance at also being a finalist. And so I'm so happy to have made it um, to this uh, prestigious group of people. I really look forward to going forward at the whole um, through the whole process and enjoying every minute of it with all the wonderful opportunities that we're going to have. I'm sure people are curious. Why are you in Finland? I fell in love with the language. I bought a small book just to, to learn the basics because it's an extremely one of the most difficult yeah, languages wow. to learn, they say. And uh, when I got to Juilliard, we have the opportunity to take classes at Columbia University. And so I saw that Finnish was, uh, it was actually almost axed as a course because nobody was really taking the course. And I signed up and uh, yeah, now I'm living here. I, I'm, I'm practically fluent. I had about five semesters of class and that was about five years ago. So now being immersed in the culture and living here is, uh, has been really wonderful. And so I'm, I'm really excited to be here. I'm American Pianist Awards finalist, Mackenzie Melamed, and I will see you in Indy. Uh, my parents aren't musicians. My aunt, uh, my, my mother's youngest sister, got me started on piano. We started at four years old. And then around eight years old, I started studying with a, not, a teacher not in my family. No. And now you're also booking? You've got, you've got an agency of some sort? There came a point where I realized that 
I could actually do more if I didn't play. Of course, it doesn't mean I don't play. I mean, I do absolutely play my own music, you know, and the music of, of great composers in the past. But there is an element in the administrative organizing facets of what we do that can actually get more done in a strange way. It's kind of like going from an actor to a producer. You still want to do both, but you have the chance to create something larger than yourself. You know, just like um, on piano, we always emphasize being able to imitate different instruments and to be able to make those different colors. I think um, that is, that's what we do as pianists. But I think there's another side to that where we can actually, instead of imitating another instrument, just realize uh, to bring into reality that yeah. different instrumentation that, that one had imagined. Yeah. I believe you graduated from TCU when you were 16. That's eh? right. That's right. Some interesting life circumstances happened that caused me to have to drop out of middle school and in search of an alternative it was deemed that the best solution would be why don't we just put him in college and see if he can survive out there um, i was originally majoring in math and music and after playing my first ever concerto with orchestra which was at age 13. case after playing that uh concert at tcu which was beethoven's third piano concerto i thought to myself you know what this is this is pretty fun this is pretty great i think i should give this a go not knowing all the challenges that would come with a career in in music but here we are now i'm american pianist awards finalist sam hong and i'm looking forward to seeing you in indy I started playing the piano when I was about seven. That's when I first touched the instrument and developing my fondness for it. Growing up, you know, 10 years old, 11 years old, and then early high school, certain pianists that would come you know, to solo with the orchestra, one that comes to mind is Stephen Hoff, who was very generous to give master classes to younger students. I remember that particular occasion was very inspiring to, you know, to really be able to work with someone one-on-one -on -one and then see him perform at the highest level that weekend. We, we, we could also connect to artists like that, and, and they weren't you know, these like alien beings that were just doing things that we couldn't understand. And that made a big impact on my life, and I, I imagine many other kids' uh, lives. It's a pleasure to meet especially you, because I, I, I've certainly been following your career over the past few years. Uh, you know, I, I uh, remember starting my work on the Goldberg Variations back in, in 2016, 2017, and uh, I remember watching actually some of your videos, and I was like, who's this guy that's improvising on, you know, the, the Bach? And I thought that was absolutely amazing. Uh, especially uh, the Wigmore concert. So big fan, and it, it's an you know it's an honor to be talking with you this afternoon. It's pretty cool to know that uh, the work I've done on that has meant something to you, coming from that that other perspective. Universally, the message all comes down to uh, actually something that Clara Schumann was very fond of saying: play the notes, just the notes as written, and this is really key as written uh, because. The thing that's really always fascinating to me is that our profession, being a musician, it's kind of like being a, being a historian. And when you uncover a score, when you open up a, a, a sheet music, um, you're looking at these markings. And these are really just such impactful. Every single uh, slur, every single dynamic marking, it's, it's a, it's a, you're gleaning into the psyche of this literal genius. I was always taught to honor the composer first and foremost. There's many ways to do that. I mean, everyone has their unique voice, but I think that's something that all my teachers have always instilled in me, that we have our own voice, yes, but it's in respect and at the service of the composer. Playing just the notes uh, is it, kind of a, a cop-out. It, it, it's not saying uh, to just play the notes with no emotion and no uh, personality, but uh, everything that you do just has to be really uh, respectful to uh, the people that, that wrote the music. I am American Pianist Awards finalist, Dominic Cayley, and I'm looking forward to seeing you in Indy. My grandma, who, who's Italian, and she uh, grew up, you know, listening to opera, and she was really loved sort of all the aria, the Italian opera arias. You know, she put on a recordings of operas for me to listen to. When I was around five, my mom decided that I should have some music lessons, you know, just because that's what parents do. Sure. <laughs> in New York City, in the village, there's a nice little school called the Greenwich House of Music. And I started taking 
piano lessons and nobody thought anything of it. And then the teacher called my parents in one day and said, you know, he's reading the music quickly. And that, that was sort of what I was very good at was sight reading. Then I went to Manhattan School of Music pre-college and I started studying there. I was there for about 10 years before I went to college. You look at it and you think, okay, I, I'm going to learn this another Chopin piece I'm going to learn, but then you, when you really like start to look at it, it just becomes deeper and deeper and more and more complex. You know, just the amount of things that you can bring out and also the technical aspect of it. Just everything is completely, ex a little bit like Mozart, is just completely exposed. I just, I'm so intrigued by the um, variety uh, and the uh, the aptitude of your artistry. It's really uh, very, very impressive and uh, very enjoyable. Listening to some Albenes played by the pianist Carlo Vidusa, it's a live performance of book three and four of the Iberia. And I'm just listening to it and I'm thinking like the interpretation is like in Malaga or Eritania. It's like you really feel, you really feel like you are in these places that the, that the piece is describing, just in little stylistic things that he does and certain, the way that he stretches certain phrases. And what this man brought to it is just something where I'm not even thinking about the piano playing. Like I'm not listening thinking, oh, you know, he's doing this with his, you know, he's doing this and that with his right hand and this sound is, no, I'm just, I'm listening to a real interpretation. I just like to see more of a balance like that. And I want to see people who are sort of doing it because they really want to explore these pieces and make something of their own, you know, if an interpretation. Hi, I'm Michael Davidman. I'm an American Pianist Awards finalist and see you in Indy. One of my first memories of music was listening to opera with my with my grandfather. He was you know, he's Italian heritage and was born in Italy, so uh, he had a lifelong love of opera. And we would watch the three tenors, and I was I was really into that when I was like two or three years old, something crazy like that. So so uh, music has always been a part of my life, always been the main thing in 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 my life. And I'm, I'm lucky that I've always pretty much known what I've wanted to do. My family just had a piano in the house. It was a little upright piano wedding gift from my grandmother to my mother. I started fiddling around with it. I actually started on violin first because my, my brother was already playing the piano. So my parents were like, OK, let's give him something different. But, uh, but I, I always really gravitated towards the piano. When you're young and just starting, it's so much easier to make a better sound on the piano. You're really like squeaky on violin and stuff, and it's just not, not as pleasant. I think ultimately my love for music and the reason I'm a pianist just just comes from uh, just comes from being there in the house and you know having that piano there and just researching it on my own. Well, Kenny, it's been such a pleasure to talk to you and to get to know you and hear yeah, you. It's just beautiful playing, and, and uh, I wish you all the best of luck. I haven't done much composing. It's kind of something I started when all the concerts got canceled because of COVID. Oh. Uh, so, you know, it's something I've always wanted to try to do. And, and you know, even if I, di I didn't do it with the intention of, you know, really performing anything in public, uh, I just wanted to do it to learn the harmonic system better and to get a better understanding of the composers. But uh, it's it's something I've really spent most of my time doing this year because I've I've gotten so into it. Yeah. And it's it's really been... Uh, brought me a lot of joy to, uh, to to learn how to do it and to learn a new skill. Do you use um, it at the keyboard uh, when you compose, or are you composing away from the keyboard? A mixture of the two. I was I was reading that Bach, uh, he would always want to compose away from yeah. uh, the keyboard because uh, he thought you should be able to hear it all in your head. And considering Bach's contrapuntal style, I, I can't imagine how he could possibly have done that. That's just unbelievable to me. Hi, my name is Kenny Broberg. I'm a finalist for the American Pianists Awards, and I'm looking forward to seeing you in Indy. We are back, 
and with us is Drew Peterson, the 2017 winner of the awards. Greetings, Drew. Hi, Sylvia. Hi. Uh, Drew, you may remember that I was a co-host in 2017 when you won, and I remember so well your performance of the Prokofiev Piano Concerto No. 2 that night. Have you played it since? And tell us a little bit about what other concertos you've played, given the fact that not much has been happening the last year and a half. Well, first, a little story. I was supposed to play Prokofiev No. 2 with the Delaware Symphony this past mm -hmm. season. However, the past season has been a little crazy with our <laughs> pandemic that we've been witnessing and living through. And as you mentioned before, most importantly is that we are all being as safe and healthy as possible. Yes. And I am so thankful. That, so are we. Yes, yes. For so you, thankful. for your health. Yes. And for the health of all the pianists. All the pianists, yeah. the whole indie community. It is mm -hmm. so great to be back here to see so many familiar faces. Indianapolis really, the, the American Pianist Association, the awards really does create a family around piano Good. and it's, it's really really incredible yeah. to have had the support of everyone here over oh, the past through the competition can, and for the past four years i can feel the people wanting to clap yes. down yes, there yes, yes. <laughs> Like an airline pilot, you like have a plan. Pilot. You have exactly. a plan. Exactly. No, it's you... really true. I think we really have to have a plan when we're out there on stage. I mean, even down to like how many steps does it take to walk from the 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 edge of the stage to the piano? I mean, that's something we don't know. I think really, oftentimes, the scariest part for me being on stage is getting through that orchestra because each orchestra really, has yeah. its own path to get from yeah. the side stage to the bench. And getting to the bench is sometimes the hardest thing we do. Okay, okay, so, so tell me this. Do you go down stage of the first violins or do you wind your way through the, between the first violins and the second it violins? It depends. This is the problem. Oh, it's I see. always different. Uh, I, okay. And then the question is, when, when do you take your bow? Are you gonna shake the concertmaster's hand first? Are you yes. going to are you going to nod to the conductor yes. first or are you going to ignore him at first? Yeah. I mean it's it, never wants ignore to the conductor. Never ignore the conductor. They Sometimes, have the power exactly. to hire you. <laughs> it's true. Sometimes they don't want you to make a big scene though. Sometimes yeah, they true. want you to just go out there, take your bow, and then afterwards you can say hello on stage. So there's all of these it's funny things we Small learned. things that there are, are some, not small. Not I was always afraid I was going to bump into some violinist's bow walking through this section. Oh, absolutely. Sometimes the, the violinists have to make room for you. Some, sometimes <laughs> they're parting the waves. I know. You walk in and then close it back <laughs> up. Know. You're not getting out of here anytime soon. Have you been healthy? Have you, have you been well this whole year? Yes, fortunately, and yes. And what how, about, how about you? Well, I've, I, I've been very healthy, but I'm retired, so it's easy for me. How have you kept your mental health without concerts to play and paychecks? to deposit. How have you, <laughs> you think it's funny. This is big stuff. How have you kept yourself together, body and soul? Well, okay, first of all, many, many, many walks and many yeah. runs. I mean, I live in the yeah. Northeast, I live in New Jersey, a good three months of the year, you're not really going outside. Or actually, sorry, more like four or five months of the year because sometimes it gets a little too hot in the summer to walk right, outside. Right, so right. walk's very important. Nature, Nature, good, very good, important. Good, good, The other thing is I'm so blessed to have the support of my loving family. I was able to move back home. I was able to be in New Jersey with a roof over my head, food to eat, and most mm. really companionship. Now, mm -hmm. that being said, it's important to have balance. I mean, to be around the same three people, my parents and younger <laughs> brother, all the time, you know, it's it can be difficult. Difficult, but I am so, so, so thankful. We 
all were as easy on each other as possible. We were all able to get out and do our own things as much as we could. And most importantly, I was able to practice not too much. Very important, if you overdo it, you can strain yourself, mm -hmm, you can get mm -hmm. tired. And at, at the end of the day, it's, I feel it's so important when practicing to be in the right frame of mind. And you really have, for, in my world at least, I have a window of time, so many hours a day. It mm -hmm. changes every day. I kind of, through the pandemic, I was able to be flexible, which is a big luxury with the schedule. And I would practice the requisite number of hours that I felt I could concentrate and get mm -hmm. work done. And then it's important to turn off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very Good for you. easier said than done, though, when all you have is piano and Netflix for, for weeks on end, months on end. Month, so, and a of year course, and a half. You, you can't watch Netflix all the time either. Oh, so. really? I can. I'm really good oh, at good watching for you. Netflix You're a, a lot. Pro. You're a pro. I have to, I have to take lessons from you. <laughs> we have a real pianist sitting up here. Yes, sir. And he's a superstar. Oh, my gosh. Terrence McKnight from WQXR is with us. And I'm sure he'd love to talk to you about the, the, the piano part of all of this. Yeah, because Drew, after winning this uh, competition back in 17, I think you came to New York and you actually played uh, over at our, our, our studio, our radio studio. You did some work in the green space. Yes, exactly. I, I went to the green space soon after 2017's win, played some of the repertoire. I believe yeah. I played Bach, F, F sharp minor toccata, Liszt's Mazeppa, that crazy etude yep. from the Transcendentals a couple other pieces. And it's, it's really, really wonderful to play in New York. I mean, it's so interesting how, <laughs> how we, as a New York, New Jersey boy, one gets around and then sometimes one finds oneself not playing as much in the hometown as one might. Yeah. So it's, I think it's really important and it's important to do that most of all because I then get to play for my friends and family. They get to come mm -hmm. and hear me and it's, it's so nice. Now this play. weekend, I'm not sure if you had an official role, but I think I saw you turning pages a few times. Right? Actually, we yes. had we had a comment uh, uh, come to us through the text on text thread on the live feed. Is that Drew Peterson turning pages? <laughs> and this is why I don't look at the live feed. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm wondering, is there, you know, are you having conversations with with the artists? Are you giving them advice? Are you noticing anything? Are you telling them don't go past the concert master this way? Make sure you sh are you. <laughs> Are you sharing any advice with Well, I'm noticing players? a lot. I mean, I'm, I'm only going to all the performances and I'm hearing everyone. Many of these people are dear friends of mine, many of whom mm. I've gone to school with. Some Michael Davidman, for example, from a very young age, we, we've known oh each other. Goodness. And Mackenzie, yeah. a little older, but we spent many formative years together at Juilliard studying with the same teacher. And some of the others I know a little less kind of formally and others not so much at all, but I know who all of these guys are. They're all fantastic. They all have their unique voice and one of them mentioned that in the video and it's so important I think if I were to say anything to any pianist or any musician is that we we just have to develop and stay true to what we have to say and what we have to share with the music because mm -hmm. that's really that's what we have that's it's, what this is about it's what it's it? about yeah. I have one quick question and I see that the judges have returned OMG it's about time but I want to ask you one quick question Maybe this isn't such an easy, quick answer, but we've, Terrence and I have been talking a little bit about this. What is it like to have competition with arts? That's, that's hard, right? This isn't like the Olympic trials where whoever crosses the finish line first gets to be on the Olympic team. This is artistry with so much individuality and how do you compare Beethoven to Scriabin to Albanese to Saint-Saëns? How, how do you put competition, how do you layer competition on top of art and artistry? How do you do well, that? This is a long, long, long answer. You'll uh, write a book someday. Question. Someday I'll write a book. But the short answer is one can't, of course. It's, it's right. We can't really, we can compare, but we can't say one's better than the other, worse than the other. You can't even really compare some, to, to some extent. But I will say this, the competition is an arena to be heard. And that's the most important thing, that we are able to be heard. And it's wonderful. To yeah, be heard. great, great, great. And my thought on it, Sylvia. As, as I'm sitting here listening to all five men play, I thought yeah. 
there may be one, lo one winner, but there will be no losers because when they walk away, yeah. they'll still have this experience and all of that talent and all of these connections. So. And, and they'll also each have $50,000, right. which in previous competitions was only for the winner. But thanks to Joel Harrison and this great organization, they are each walking away with $50,000. Okay. <laughs> I see, I see the APA board chair, Jean Richcreek, has come to the podium. So let's go to the stage for announcements. Oh, <clears throat> thank you all for being here. Mic's not on. Okay, thank you all for being here. It is so exciting for us to be here to hear these wonderful pianists with you in person as we were not sure all year we would be able to do. Uh, so thank you so much for being here. I know there's not as many of you as we might have had, but uh, we have indeed done it. I want to, uh, I know what you're waiting for. <clears throat> this is not the envelope with the winner. Uh, I know you're waiting for the big reveal, and uh, so am I. But before I turn this over to Joel, I want to take a moment to recognize some other great performers that have not been on the stage this last weekend or all last year. The APA board and board and uh, staff have been so remarkably, so remarkably flexible and creative this year. <clears throat> I'm not quite sure how many times we planned and replanned this, uh, this competition. But with every roadblock put in our way, Joel and company and the board was able to move around them. So I thank you so much for that. <clears throat> I also want to recognize our artistic partners. We can't do this without the symphony, without the other performers who've worked with us, and they too had to be so flexible with changing venues, changing dates, even the number of performances, and uh, at times the repertoire to fit within what we're allowed to do with COVID. So that have been remarkable. And then finally, our supporters. This doesn't happen without our donors, without our sponsors, and without our host family. So we are, want to say that we appreciate so many of those of you. You're behind the scenes. You're not on stage. But you're great performers. So now I'd like to turn this over to Joel Harrison, our CEO and artistic director, who will finally give us the big reveal. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. And Jean has been such a loyal supporter herself, uh, constantly being in touch with us in the office and just doing basically everything that needed to be done. And uh, a, a truly great chair, so I'm grateful to her. Uh, I'm also grateful we have uh, a number of uh, former chairs of the board with us today. And uh, this will be my last time speaking to you as CEO. And I want to say a special thanks to those who've served uh, during my tenure of 21 years, uh, you've been just great. And I am indeed so, so grateful to you for all that you've done. Okay. Actually, I do have an envelope, but I'm not ready to open it yet. <laughs> um, first, I want to say a special thanks to Mark, uh, Marsh Davis, who is uh, the uh, CEO here at uh, Landmark Center and to some of the officials from the Indiana Department of Transportation. In case you haven't noticed, <laughs> there's a lot of construction going on with big equipment, and that equipment makes lots and lots of noise. <laughs> um, we asked them to quit, and they did. <laughs> <clears throat> And Marsh made that happen, so we are really grateful uh, to him. Otherwise, we really couldn't have done it because it's so noisy 
it, it would interfere with the music making and the webcast. So uh, that, was, that was a great favor. It's amazing how much influence we have. Uh, Jean mentioned a number of our artistic partners, and there's a special partner that I would like to recognize uh, formally this afternoon. Many of you have been a part of APA for quite a number of years, and you're aware that we have commissioned solo piano works for our finalists for quite a number of years. Uh, many thanks to the um, Michael and Claudette Sorel uh, Foundation, which resides in, in New York City, and they have given us uh, grants to help with this commissioning process. And this past time, uh, we, it was our pleasure to uh, commission the composer, American composer, uh, Laura Kaminsky. Uh, I had the pleasure to meet her and actually hear a premiere of her work a few years ago. One of our judges, the great uh, Ursula Oppens, was playing an actually birthday concert in New York in Merkin Hall, and she was premiering a piano quintet written by Laura for that occasion. Uh, and so I went, and actually that's where I met uh, our, one of our co-hosts today, uh, Terrence McKnight. So it was a good trip to New York. <laughs> Uh, but we are so grateful for all that the Sorrell Foundation has done for us over the years and made this commissioning project so successful. All of the works that we've commissioned have been published and are fully available to anybody that wants to buy the score and learn it and play it. Um, but Laura is with us today, and I want to say a special thanks. It's been great to get to know her. We had a Zoom conference some while ago with Laura and the five finalists who had all kinds of questions to ask. It was really informative to hear the kinds of things our pianist would ask and the kinds of things that Laura would say uh, about that compositional process. I learned a lot. Um, so really a great, great project for us. So Laura, where are you? There he is. So please come forward. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, I love what I do. I've often told uh, the board I could make life really simple and a lot, lot less expensive if you would just let me choose the pianist. <laughs> <laughs> I have great taste. <laughs> and oddly enough, they always say, no, we don't think that's such a good idea, Joel. <laughs> so uh, we bring in a jury of really highly distinguished people. And I am so uh, deeply indebted to them. This is not easy work. I mean, it, it, yes, it's great to listen to the pianist and hear all this wonderful music, but then to be able to make critical artistic judgment at such a high level, um, I, I don't know how they do it. So, uh, and thankfully, uh, this was not my task uh, this particular occasion. So I want to introduce these people to you, and as I do, would each of you just come forward and remain across the front of the stage. First, coming to us, a very distinguished Canadian pianist, coming to us from uh, the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, the marvelous player and teacher, Jane Coop. Another prize winner from other competitions and kind of a, a neighbor. Uh, he comes to us from the University of Cincinnati, uh, is the Israeli pianist Ron Dunk. Another great, great pianist and uh, highly distinguished teacher and chair of the piano department at the wonderful Jacobs School of Music right down the road at Indiana University. We're proud to have Norman Krieger on the jury. Our next jury member, um, works here in town. Uh, she's been the artistic uh, administrator for the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra, 
What many people don't know is that she is a very, very well-trained classical pianist. So please welcome Katie McGinnis. And last but not least, in making a return appearance, actually, as a member of the jury uh, and someone I've known and admired for so many years is the great pianist Ursula Oppens. So thank you all for this great, great work that you've done. We do so much appreciate it. You're welcome guest at APA anytime. Hope you'll come back many, many times in the future. Thank you all. <clears throat>
We're so blessed to have so many wonderful collaborative partners uh, in the organization and makes it possible for us to be able to do the kinds of things and to include so many wonderful aspects to this prize. Um, one of those is the sponsor of the concert this afternoon, that's Steinway and Sons. And I would like to welcome to the stage the president of Steinway, my good friend, Ron Losby. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. You know, one of the cherished activities that I am able to undertake is to be at events like this, but what makes this even more important is this uh, competition, if you want to call it that, the American Pianist Association Awards are really the most special and most cherished relationship that Steinway & Sons has in this particular space. How can it be much better than having this great organization that focuses on presenting American talent to the world. And if you look at the laureates in this uh, wonderful program that we have here, virtually every one of those has made a major, major impact in the music world, whether it be in pedagogy, or it be in performance, or it be both of them. And I would just like to say that for the last 20 years, we've had a wonderful relationship with Joel. Joel has taken this organization from a certain point to really an apex that very few organizations get to enjoy. So I would just like to give Joel Harrison, from myself personally and from Steinway & Sons, a big round of applause for what he has done for this great organization. Thank you all. Um, I'm a resident of Indianapolis. I'm not going away. <laughs> You'll continue to see me for God knows how long. Um, another great uh, partner that we have here in the city that offers an absolutely wonderful aspect to our prize. I'm not aware of another uh, competition of this nature that offers this particular kind of prize in that the winner is named the artist in residence for two years at the University of Indianapolis. And I want to welcome to our stage uh, my good friend and a really great friend of APA, the president of the University of Indianapolis, Dr. Robert Manuel. Right. Thank you, Joel, and thanks for letting me offer just a few brief words. We're the University of Indianapolis, 5,500 students. We are a comprehensive liberal arts university, and we exist in between the creation of theory and its application to practice. The past year and a half has been extremely difficult because we couldn't be in community like you. We're isolated, and we've come to realize the thing that animates our work is engagement and being together. And Joel has been a terrific partner in keeping things moving through the uh, through the pandemic, and it has helped our university see the importance of being together in community. And so we are a, a grateful partner uh, of the APA, very happy to be here. Uh, we started out with Drew Peterson, are just finishing up with him at Cohen, and now we're looking forward to see, oh, I'll open that later. Now we're looking forward to the next, to the next person. <laughs> That will, that will come and be with us. This is one of our cherished partnerships, and it's a pleasure to be with you here today. Thank you. Thank you, Rob, and thank you, Ron. It's great to have you here as part of this presentation. I, <clears throat> I've said this for so many years. Um, this is not an easy decision. Uh, everybody's got an opinion, and you hear something on Friday night, and you think, oh, yeah, that's it. You hear somebody on Saturday night, yeah, that's it. Well, it's a long process, so, you know, you have to hear everything. That means all the solo recitals. That means all the chamber music, all the concertos, all the solo presentations like this. It actually is, oddly enough, uh, I think a little bit uh, 
easier this year because those of you who are familiar with how we do it, normally there's a season-long thing that we call the Premier Series where each of the finalists comes to the city for a whole week at a time. That too becomes part of the competition process and a part of the adjudication process. This time uh, we've you know, collapsed a little bit of that. So uh, we did our five solo recitals. Back in April, uh, all of the pianists came to town. We recorded 60-minute recitals uh, at the Indiana History Center. And then those began to be broadcast uh, via webcast starting on Sunday, May 23rd, and for each Sunday thereafter. And our jury, wherever they were in the world, were required to watch that in real time and make their comments uh, and then send those in signed comments, which they then had to uh, send back in to the office. And then they show up in, in town and get to hear uh, the finalist live in person, like, like you do. So it's really, uh, it's worked out very well. Uh, I will say it one last time, none of this has been ideal. I like the way we did it before the pandemic. <laughs> and to anyone who's listening, we want to do it that way again. <laughs> Um, that said, this has been a glorious, glorious process, and we've learned a lot about doing it, and really the pianists have uh, benefited because we've webcast everything. So the entire world, if they wanted to listen and watch, they've seen these five pianists over the last uh, couple of months. That alone is worth a lot. You know, it's partly about bringing forth these great American pianists to the world. And I believe that we've done that in, in significant ways. OK. <clears throat> I, the hardest thing I've ever done in my life is make this announcement. I will be very happy to turn that over to somebody else after August the 1st, because I love these guys and, and all the people. Um, but here we are. So the winner of the 2021 American Pianist Awards. It's Kenny Bober. There we have it. You heard it directly from the stage. Kenny Broberg is the new 2021 winner of the American Pianist Awards and will be the artist in residence at the University of Indianapolis. We'll record on Steinway and Sons label. Congratulations to Kenny Broberg and indeed to all the finalists with best wishes for much success. Sylvia, it's just been an incredible weekend and I've had a great time as co-host with you. How about we do it again soon? I say yes, maybe in two years, in April 2023, for the finals of the American Pianists Awards Jazz Competition. In the meantime, thanks to Steinway for its sponsorship of this finale and awards program. To Mickey and Janie Maurer, my friends, and Christian and Elaine Holden-Wolf for sponsoring Terrence and me. And to the APA and its board, amazing staff, to Joel Harrison, the APA president, CEO, and artistic director extraordinaire, and to Marsh Davis for getting the trucks to be quiet. 
and the Indiana Landmark Center for hosting this concluding event in the spectacular hall, WFYI, for filming this webcast. You all have been awesome. Such a pleasure and such an inspiration. I'm Sylvia McNair. And I'm Terrence McKnight. Thank you all, and have a good night.